no one's perfect. We all make mistakes. We all have our moments where we were not thinking about the other person and all that kind of stuff. But a true narcissist, there's going to be a pattern. And it's, you know, as you kind of reflect on the relationship you have with this person, you're going to, it's going to be very obvious. Hey guys, welcome to our Soul Fan podcast where I interview space holders from all over the world. I'm your host, my name is Carolina, and I am the Connection Catalyst. I help spiritual entrepreneurs experience deeper connection with themselves, with others, and with the universe. Today on the show, we have Adriana Bucci, the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Coach. Welcome to the show, Adriana. How are you doing? Hey Carolina, thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. The sun is still shining. I'm in beautiful Spain at the moment. And my life is just amazing. I spent half of the day on the beach just playing music and eating great food. So yeah, I'm feeling very, very good. And I'm also super excited to talk to you because you are an expert on narcissism. And I've been in a narcissistic relationship for a little bit. And I know how it feels to to be there. And I'm guessing that you have been as well because usually we are becoming who, you know, who we want to help let's say um, if we've gone through the journey of getting some kind of abuse we want to help others to do the same so I would love if you could share a little bit of your background story how did you choose to become the narcissistic abuse recovery coach uh, as much as you want to share of course because you know I guess some of this could be quite private and could be quite emotional as well and um, but yeah I would love to know what has brought you on this journey and what has inspired you to now become this kind of coach Totally. I'm such an open book with my story. So I will, I will share all but the cold notes version of it, obviously, because it's a very long story. <laughs> but basically, it kind of all started with chronic pain. Um, so I knew I had a narcissistic mother since 2014 ish. Um, but I went into denial, of course, and it was a breakup with a narcissist that kind of got me googling this type of behavior. And eventually, I would find this checklist of like signs you have a narcissistic mother. But I went back into denial for like a year and a half. So 2016, I really started to accept it. And then in 2019, I had really, really bad chronic pain. And it was going for the last four years. So from 2015 to 19, it was absolutely a nightmare. I had gotten my wisdom teeth removed. And then I started getting migraines, TMJ dysfunction, neck pain, carpal tunnel, all these crazy things were going on. And I was like in my like late 20s, like this was my mid to late 20s that this was all happening. So it was just a disaster. Um, and basically one day I kind of learned about the mind-body connection um, in January of 2019. I found this app randomly scrolling about chronic pain. Um, and it was just like the weirdest thing because I tried everything for my pain. I tried like nerve block injections, medication. I couldn't take pills anymore because I was starting to get ulcers, um, physiotherapy, all the things. Um, and just nothing really touched my pain. And it was just getting worse and worse and worse. I eventually would get shingles in my mouth with, you know, and I'd ended up with something called trigeminal neuralgia. So I was really at like this rock bottom with my chronic pain. So then I find this app and it's all about like processing your repressed emotions from childhood trauma. And that helps you kind of get out of the chronic pain. <laughs> so I thought this was nonsense when I first learned about it, but I was just so desperate for pain relief because I was trying everything. Nothing else was working for me and I had nothing to lose at that point. So I tried it. It worked. And within four months, I was pain free. Um, it was not like a comfortable journey by any means. Like there was a lot of emotions to be processed and all that kind of stuff. But once I hit the point of like 100% pain free, it took me like four months of like regularly doing the work. Um, I got the idea to become a pain coach and help other people who had chronic pain. And then the more I started kind of sharing my own story about how my chronic pain was caused by being raised by a narcissistic mother and that that absolutely is a form of trauma that people do need to heal from and like you can absolutely do it. The more that like more and more people started resonating and you know it kind of naturally switched from pain relief coaching to narcissistic abuse recovery coaching like that and yeah here I kind of am just kind of continuing to do this and help people heal from narcissistic abuse and a lot of the time survivors do have the mind body connection stuff going on as well where there's some kind of unexplained pain they've been to the doctor they've tried all the things and nothing's really helping and a lot of the times it's actually connected to how they were raised so yeah that's kind of it in a nutshell 
Mm, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm super curious to know, maybe you could give us a little bit of a definition of narcissism uh, for people who maybe don't know, or because sometimes it can be such a wake up call for someone to even just know the definition and know who are these narcissists? Like, how do they uh, act? Like, how do they function? Because so many people, even I had a friend calling me maybe like half a year ago, and he's like, Carolina, this is crazy. I've been for nine years in a narcissistic relationship and I haven't realized it. And I was going to for psychotherapy and, you know, speaking to people and whatever. And I only realized that now after I read uh, so much information about it, like, wow, this is actually the pattern. This is actually narcissism. It's not me being crazy, right? So what is narcissism? How to recognize it? So there's a lot of different types of narcissism out there, but in a nutshell, it's like someone who's just very kind of self-absorbed. Now, everybody has narcissistic traits to some extent, like it just kind of is what it is. No one's perfect. We all make mistakes. We all have our moments where we were not thinking about the other person and all that kind of stuff. But a true narcissist, there's going to be a pattern. And it's, you know, as you kind of reflect on the relationship you have with this person, you're gonna, it's going to be very obvious, but you got to sort of take your emotions out of it. Because what narcissists do is they really make you feel like you're the problem. So you know, if you're in a relationship mm. with somebody, and they're always putting the blame on you, and you know, they're saying that they're perfect, nothing's wrong with them, they didn't cause the fight, it's you, you're hysterical, you're crazy, you're this, you're that. If if you just, you know, said this in a different way, it wouldn't have caused this huge blow up fight, whatever, like, that's a really big red flag. And, you know, they do kind of play with your emotions. And the pattern that you'll notice is love bomb devalue discard. So love bombing is basically when they, you know, they come on really strong, you're the best person ever, like they, they're complimenting you a lot. It's basically whatever you want to hear. And it'll really depend on the context of the relationship, right? So if it's a romantic partnership, like, it'll be this person who swoops on in, they come on really strong, they, you know, Maybe they do these grand gestures, they have all these gifts, they're taking you out to really nice dates, stuff like that. Everything seems too good to be true almost. Um, and if it's your parent, then, you know, of course, they're still love bombing, but it's not necessarily how a romantic partnership would kind of, like a romantic narcissist would try to like woo you, you know? So a narcissistic parent might finally recognize like a talent of yours or give you some kind of hope that you know they can be a rational person or whatever so like it's really whatever it is you want to hear and then they create that trust within you and so as soon as you're at their level and you're starting to trust them and they can tell that you can trust them that's when the devaluation starts so like they'll start like little small chips at your confidence stuff like that and then the discard so that's when they have no more use for you or they'll like pretend that they're discarding you or they'll just kind of go away for a few days and then swoop right back in hook you right back in and then the whole thing sort of repeats itself over and over and over again and you know if you get into fights there's like literally nothing that resolves anything it's just a complete disaster so if you're in kind of a situation like that that's just very important to really be aware of the pattern on how things have been um, rather than getting hung up on the definition because there's so many different types of narcissists and you know there's like the overt narcissists where it's very obvious that they're narcissists and they just come off as total assholes but you know those ones it's at least they're being honest about who they are right so you can definitely tell like they're they're very much showing themselves who they are but then you've got covert narcissists and they will kind of pretend they're normal and they've got like this really great mask and they will mimic empathy and you know you you'll be fooled by them because they came off as so normal at the beginning or you know they just seem so vulnerable and so sweet and so this and so that but then behind closed doors it's like a completely different story so I hope that answers the question <laughs> Yes, it does. It does. And I guess that there are also different levels of narcissism, mm -hmm. right? Because I can see, for example, in some of my family members, I can see a little bit of narcissistic behaviors. Um, and so also, actually, that brings me to the question, like, um, when does narcissism start? Because as you said, everyone has some part of the narcissism inside. So there might be different levels of it. So I guess 
everyone has this, just a little bit, but people who are very narcissistic, who are called nar narcissists, then they have just a huge uh, part of them like this. And it's kind of like overriding all the other parts of them, I guess, right? But also I feel, feel like it all stems from coping mechanism and childhood trauma anyway for them as well. Like it's all because they haven't got enough love and now they think that they need to manipulate other people to get their needs met, right? But so what are the levels of narcissism? And, and like, because I'm thinking... You know, is it possible for each narcissist, no matter what level of narcissism they have inside, is it possible to heal in terms of like, are they actually able or able on all levels to develop a healthy relationship? Or do you feel like some are just so ingrained in their narcissism that it's actually impossible to get them out of it? Because usually these people are so self-absorbed and self-centered that it's hard to even for them to take anyone's perspectives apart from their, their own perspective, right? Because they think that they are the right ones and they always are right. And the opinions of others don't, doesn't matter that much because they know. So how, like, how do you feel? Is it possible for everyone to, let's say, heal this narcissistic uh, part of them or not really? No, no, not at all. So like a true narcissist is never going to change. And of course there's people who have trauma, who have narcissistic traits, but like they, you know, it's the intentionality behind it, right? So someone who discovers and is able to self-reflect and realize, I don't like how I behaved and I don't like how this impacted other people and I don't want to be this way. You're not a narcissist <laughs> if that's how you think, right? And like, even if you discover mm -hmm. it later in life, like, oh my God, like, I, I don't like this about me. Let me go get help for it. And then you actually genuinely go get help for it and actually do the work. You were never a narcissist. You were just someone who was functioning under trauma. And the thing with trauma survivors is that we tend to think really badly of ourselves, you know? So it's like, we will take the blame and we will take the hit. So like half the time that like someone who's a genuine trauma survivor who is capable of changing, you know, they'll realize like once they do all the healing work, oh, okay, like I was functioning out of survival and I can actually forgive myself for this. And they'll actually not behave that way anymore because they know how to kind of manage their trauma responses. Whereas a narcissist, it they're not going to do that. Like, they just don't care. They don't think anything is wrong with them. They think the problem is everybody else. They will not self-reflect. And if they do, like, it's it's going to be to manipulate you at the end of the day. So it might look like they have a lower level of narcissism, but they actually don't. Like, if you're a narcissist, you're a narcissist, you're a narcissist, end of story kind of thing. And I mean, I know that sounds really general, but there is no hope that they're going to change. And if you've been dealing with a grown adult who's been promising that they're going to change and they've done nothing to do it, like you've got to sort of kill that false hope um, because we can get stuck in that false hope where, you know, when you're a normal, decent human being with empathy and emotions, you're one of those people who just wants to see the best in everybody. You want to believe that people can change, but there has to come a point in your own life where you've, if you've been waiting and waiting and waiting for somebody to change and it's just like impacting your mental health and all that kind of stuff and your emotional health and like your progress in your own life, you have to sort of take a step back and remember this is an adult. And they're actively choosing their behavior. And if you're dealing with a narcissist, they are actively choosing their behavior. They are calculating it because they're just trying to get that reaction out of you. And, you know, the thing with narcissists as well is that they treat their relationships differently. So it really depends if you are their main form of supply. So if you're their main target, you're going to be getting it the worst from this narcissist. But there could be narcissists in your life who they're targeting somebody else and they don't seem so bad. And you don't think that they're a narcissist until you maybe get close to that person and you start sort of seeing the signs. So it really is one of those things where you just have to sort of, I don't want to say trust your gut because a lot of the times you're being gaslit from trusting your gut. But if something feels off, with that person like you want to definitely kind of have that radar and observe that person and how they react and all that kind of stuff and you know just kind of question like what does this person get out of this relationship that we have and am I giving more than I'm receiving for this person am I exhausted when I'm around this person does this person kind of like suck my energy when I, whenever I have a conversation with them. And like one of the biggest clues is if you're exhausted after talking to somebody, like that's a big red flag that you're dealing with an emotional vampire of some sort. And that's never going to be a good thing. So 
they can be really like tricksters um, and that's what they do. Cause like a con artist is not going to expose themselves. So if someone's trying to con you into something, they're not going to like explain what their tactics are and you're not even going to know about it. So narcissists function in the same way where they're basically conning you into giving them supply, which is your emotional reaction because they feed off of that. And it's just like a really weird life goal for them to have at the end of the day. <laughs> it is weird, but also it's quite spoken about. Yeah. I think the most scary and uh, I mean, I've been in a relationship like that for a little bit and I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Before, for example, before the relationship, the scary thing about it is that you sometimes cannot see mm -hmm. this pattern before you actually like zoom out and it ends. You cannot even see how manipulated you were in the relationship because well, while it lasted, it was because of all these manipulation tactics, you thought that it's all good and this person made you believe that, oh, they love you so much or, oh, this relationship is uh, whatever it is right mm -hmm. but only then when you end this relationship you're like oh my god what the fuck was i even doing there with this person like how okay. did it happen that this person was able to manipulate me so much and i was just like that and you know i'm quite a rebellious uh, person so for me like i couldn't i was only for two or three months with this person because i was like oh, Geez, he's not gonna tell me what to yeah. do like what the fuck you know and, i'm glad you and, found out fast i'm like daddy yeah Yeah, I know, but you know, my best friend yeah. didn't find out that fast. That's my horrible, best friend yeah. found out found it out after two years, and I had to like she had to break contact with everyone, uh, also with me for some time in order to realize like, oh my god, you know. And I was telling telling her that like, hey, this is what's happening. He's manipulating you and whatever, but she didn't see it. And I think that if you're in it, you're gonna even defend this person who is treating you badly because you so believe in what they're saying because they have so many tactics to manipulate you in in a way that you don't even know that you're manipulated and that's i think that's the most scary things and i would like to talk mm -hmm. about these manipulation tactics because if someone that listens to us maybe is like oh red flag alarm uh, you know maybe i am in a narcissistic relationship whether it's a parent or a partner I would like to talk about these tactics and we touched upon one of them, which uh, I call personally, or rather uh, I, I learned it from my mentor, Teal Swan. She calls it intermittent reinforcement, where what you said before, it's kind of like an addictive behavior where you, where you get so much love and so many words of affirmation and you're so amazing and it's everything is great and then for some time it's just completely shit and you're the worst and you're devalued and you don't deserve anything but then you're you're kind of like just waiting for this dopamine hit and serotonin hit when this person is going to tell you that everything is great again it's like a sinusoid and it's even more addictive uh, for our brain these dopamine hits these serotonin hits that um you know if we get this it's kind of such a hook uh, for our mm -hmm. consciousness because like oh oh my god when is when is this person gonna give me all these all this love all this approval all these words of affirmation especially that we care about them so much and we are and usually people who are in a relationship with the narcissist are codependent as well so the codependent people crave this need and attention and whatever and so okay before we uh, before you answer this question about manipulation techniques i would love you to share the definition of codependency so that people who listen know what we're talking about here Yeah, for sure. So like codependency, in my opinion, it's like something that narcissists create. So they want to create you. They want to create that codependency feeling for you where you feel like you need this person in order to survive. So it just sort of almost becomes a life and death thing. And so if you're with a, if you have a narcissistic parent, you're gonna you're gonna be codependent to some extent. And that doesn't mean that there's like a flaw with you just because you've got codependent traits. And that would just be anything where it's like, you just you need to have someone there. You're afraid of like being by yourself, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and I mean, it's not the ideal way to live, of course, in that codependent state, but just having that understanding on like why you are that way can be very helpful in, you know, changing that eventually over time and not, you know, wanting to change that overnight because overnight change is like a massive identity crisis. So if you're a codependent, there's nothing wrong with you. It's literally a result of how you have been conditioned by narcissistic abuse to crave that attention from the narcissist, to crave their validation, their approval, to need like that love from that person. Um, and then, you know, maybe seeking it from elsewhere if you can't find it from that person. So just really a matter of understanding that. And that's really created through the love bombing. So, you know, that first stage where like, you're amazing, you're this, you're that, you kind of get that feeling of like, wow, like this person sees me, this person recognizes like what I have to bring to the table, what I have to offer. 
And like, you know, when it's a parent and they're love bombing you, it's like, wow, okay, my, my mom finally sees me. This is great. Like, you know, now we can have that mother daughter relationship I've always wanted. And then that creates even more of that codependency. So you just have to be hyper aware of that and understand that it's not you and that you have some kind of flaw. It's like someone literally has been manipulating you in order in being this way so that they get supply from you. And yeah, I hope that I feel like I rambled Mm. a bit there, but I hope that answers it. Yeah, absolutely. But also I feel like narcissists are the ones who are self-centered, but also yeah, codependent people totally. are self-centered too, because they also want to have their needs met. And so mm-hmm. everyone, whether it's called narcissism or codependency, everyone is a narcissist anyway, yeah. because it's like a self-centered thing to do, whether you crave this need and approval and then crave to be with another person all the time. And I was there like maybe mm-hmm. around seven years ago, I didn't even see a point of spending time by myself. I didn't even know why would I do that? If I can Mm -hmm. spend time with someone, why would I even spend time with myself? And now spending time with myself, is one of the best thing ever. (laughs) And I love it. And I just want to spend so much time with myself every single day because it's so amazing how I can connect to myself, to my soul, to just everything. Right. And before I was just like, what's the point? If I can go with my friend out, why would I go out by myself? uh, For example. So I've been there and I feel like also, I feel like, yeah, I, I see in myself both of these narcissistic and codependent traits. And I feel like everyone has both, but just the degree to which we express them varies. And also based on how much traumas we have healed and how much work on ourselves we have we have done, we can kind of like let go of these patterns slowly and uh, more and more. And I also don't want to blame it all on narcissists. I mean, of course, like they are the ones who create uh, the shitty dynamics, maybe, but also like, you know, I feel like codependent people also kind of put the uh, the fuel to the fire in a way. And uh, we are like, both of these dynamics are unhealthy. So we need to see them and we need to see which of them we are expressing maybe even more. But all, ultimately, I feel like we need to accept all of them, all of the parts of, of that, of ourselves that are like that, because the more we can accept it in ourselves, the more we can accept it in others. And then the more peaceful we can be in really just notice that, okay, this person behaves like that, but there's nothing wrong with them. They were probably hurt in the past as well. And this is why they behave like that. Maybe they had narcissistic parents as well. And so we shouldn't blame anyone here. We should just learn and be conscious and be aware and see if these dynamics are playing out or not and really see them for for what they are. And if we need to leave a relationship or, I don't know, stop talking to a family member, then we probably should to just take care of our own good. But ultimately, let's let's forgive them. (laughs) That's what I'm trying to say let's forgive them because they they don't know uh, what they are doing they are not doing it consciously and I mean actually this is a question from me to you do you feel like they are the narcissists are manipulating and we're going to talk about these manipulation tactics as well and do you feel like they are manipulating based on subconscious programs and trauma or do you feel like it's conscious it's both in my opinion and I know that they they do consciously calculate how they're going to manipulate people. Um, And so, you know, I have a different opinion on forgiveness myself. I think it's not necessary in order to heal. I think that the best thing you can do is just process your feelings about that person. So if you're angry with that person, let yourself be angry. And then you'll be able to let go of the anger. And then forgiveness sort of becomes irrelevant because then this person just becomes a non-issue in your life once you've done all that inner emotional work around that person, right? Um, and, you know, they they definitely know what they're doing. That's the thing, right? And it's like, if you call them out and you even show them proof, they're still going to deny, deny, deny everything because they just don't want to admit anything. And they know that, right? And so they have like whatever their conditioning is that they feel like they need to protect their ego at whatever cost. And they don't give a, they don't give a fuck whoever's being hurt on the other side of this like that's not okay right so it's like you know they they are kind of evil people at the end of the day and being aware of you know how they function because they will out themselves at some point so if you you know they they will admit themselves what they're doing but they'll do it in a way where it's not like obvious but they'll still deny everything. So that takes some deal of awareness. They're not like in this weird trance state where they have no idea what's going on. They have no idea what words they're saying or what actions they're taking. And if that's the case, like 
I mean, shouldn't the cops be involved or something? You know, if you're completely delusional and have no idea what you're doing, like you need to you need to go seek medical attention immediately if that's actually the case. And that's not actually the case, which is why they refuse medical attention. So it's really the intention behind what they're doing. And so, yeah, you can say that codependency is a narcissistic trait, but the intention behind the trauma responses it is what matters right so with a narcissist their intention is to get that reaction out of you to destroy you to you know very much get you in that state of bamboozled bam, bamboozlement because they thrive off of that and they know that and they're creating the environment in order to extract that from their targets and that's not something that people do unknowingly like completely on an unconscious level like they know they absolutely know so yeah, mm. <laughs> roundabout way of saying yes, they totally know, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Because a codependent, mm-hmm. their intention would be like, mm-hmm. they just have mm-hmm. this void, right? Or like they feel like they need to, they need this attention from this person in order to survive, but it's not necessarily to destroy their self-esteem, right? Whereas with a narcissist, it is to destroy their self-esteem. So it's like two sides of a different coin in a way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I understand. Uh, thank you for sharing your perspective. And uh, yeah, I totally agree with you when it comes to like releasing anger or re- releasing resentment. And I feel like then forgiveness uh, comes by itself, but it's mm-hmm. about resolving these uh, feelings that you don't exactly. have inside because you are actually hurting yourself if you're angry or if you're resentful. It's actually exactly. uh, you have a problem <laughs> if yeah. you hold this anger still. Totally. Um, so let's get to these manipulation techniques because I'm sure. really curious how to recognize uh, these manipulation techniques and what are day sure so i mean the biggest one would be love bombing right so it's like you know actions not matching words would be a huge thing to recognize and so they can it can look so different in different contexts so i mean specifics it it can really vary right but like if they're kind of just being super super attentive and you know telling you what you want to hear but not actually following through, then there is probably a manipulation tactic going on, right? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's really like the love bombing, the charm, the, the false hope, those are like the biggest kind of manipulation tactics out there. Um, And, you know, just playing on people's emotions. So if you ever feel like your emotion, and this is why it's just so important to be in touch with your emotions, especially if you're a survivor of narcissistic abuse, because you can actually tell when someone is pulling at your emotional strings in order to get a reaction out of you. So like guilt tripping, for example, like narcissists oh, love. Yes. Yep. That's a big one. <laughs> That's a huge one. They love guilt tripping their targets. And like, you know, like a narcissistic parent might say something like, oh, I, I did all these sacrifices for you. I, you know, mm-hmm. I put you through school. I did this, this and that for you. So you have to be grateful. And it's like, well, like no one told you to have kids. So if like doing the bare minimum was too much <laughs> for you, like why didn't you use the resources that were available to help you? You know, if that would have prevented yeah, and child it- abuse. <laughs> Isn't it, isn't it like your role as a parent to right. actually bring me as a child and give me everything? Like, isn't right. it your role? Right. Like, I didn't have a choice in my existence. Like, hello. <laughs> but that's the thing. Society yeah. doesn't yeah. really see it that way. Like, it's very much like parents are glorified, especially mothers. So it's like, if you even talk about having a narcissistic mother, it's like, oh, you can't say bad things about mothers. They're all perfect angels. Um, so, you know, guilt trips. Narc mothers love guilt trips. Um, fear tactics. So like guilt, fear, shame, sense of obligation. Those are the three, emo- the four emotions and feelings to really look out for. And those are the main manipulation tactics as well. So like if you're feeling guilty, but you didn't commit a crime, <laughs> you know, if you didn't go out of your way to hurt somebody, um, you know, in any way, shape or form, you're not guilty of anything. Like, you know, you're probably guilty of just like, finding the truth in the situation with the narcissist, but they want to deflect the blame onto you and make you the bad guy so that you're giving supply. They're not wrong. They escape accountability and you feel like shit about yourself. Um, Fear, right? They want you to be afraid. So it's like, if, if I lose this person or like, if I cut contact off with my mother, like I'm the worst person in the world or, you know, 
this person's going to do a smear campaign against me. They're going to start spreading these rumors about me. And that's really scary. Right. So it's like stuff like that to watch out for um, shame. If you're feeling ashamed of yourself, if they're making fun of you over anything, like they will make fun of anything. And, you know, it could be like a random hobby that you have, but they try to convince you that it's a stupid hobby to have. So then you stop kind of doing it because you're so ashamed of yourself because this person that you hold in high regard thinks it's stupid. So anytime that you have someone on a pedestal, that would be another red flag, right? If anyone kind of pedestals themselves into your life, look out for that. That's a manipulation tactic. Cause it's like, this person wants you to see them as like above you. Why? right? And then just the sense of obligation would be the other thing to look out for too. Like, if you feel obligated, but like, there's no like legal contract in place that obligates you to like perform a duty, right? You're not actually obligated to anything, nothing bad's going to happen to you, but this person's wrath. Um, So you know, they might, you know, just freak out on you if you don't fulfill your obligation or whatever. But it's like, there's it's one of those things where there's literally no law that you have to do this you don't really have to do this um so it's just really kind of taking an inventory of what makes sense and what doesn't make sense and not going to the narcissist to clarify that for you because they're going to confuse the crap out of you and anytime that you are confused you're probably being manipulated so you know relationships with normal people there's no confusion it's just like Everything is what it is. If there is confusion, it can be sorted out fairly quickly. But if you're with a narcissist and you've got confusion, that's a huge red flag because they're not going to, if anything, they're going to cause even more confusion. And they do this because people who are in a confused state or in a fearful state, a guilty state, a, a shameful state, they're easier to control. So really having that, you know, awareness of your own internal world and how you're feeling and if it's any of those things, guilt, fear, shame, obligation, confusion, bamboozlement of any kind, there's probably some kind of manipulation tactic going on. So then it's kind of your job to sort of examine that manipulation tactic, examine what does this person want from me? What do I actually want? And does this make sense? And if it's an incompatible thing, mm-hmm. then it's probably some sort of manipulation tactic going on. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. And I would love to touch upon one more uh, because you mentioned it before, which is gaslighting. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I would love you to explain what gaslighting is, because I feel like that's a very common one to be used by narcissists. And Mm -hmm. I I had it used uh, on me, (laughs) so I know uh, exactly how it feels. So could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So gaslighting is when anybody kind of tries to make you question reality. So, you know, a narcissist they love gaslighting. um, And they do it to just mess with you so that, you know, they escape accountability. So they may have just said what they said that you're accusing them of saying (laughs) that, you know, it's not even accusation, because they literally just said it. And then you say, like, well, why would you say that they might say, I never said that you're crazy. What are you talking about? That was one big hallucination, you need to get like your brain checked out. And then you start believing, oh, Maybe I am crazy because I could have sworn that that happened and that they did say that, but now they're telling me that that didn't happen. So I don't know what to do. Um, And then that puts you in that confused state. So, you know, it's anything like, I never said that. I never did that. They obviously did. Um, They might say you're crazy. They might tell you you're being too sensitive. So narcissists do things that would piss anybody off. And then if you react in a state of anger, (laughs) right? If you're angry with them for something that they did and you try to tell them this, they're going to say, you're crazy. You're overreacting. You're being way too, way too dramatic. But really, it's just to provoke you into reacting even more. And then that could turn into like reactive abuse where you look like you're the abuser and then they can point the finger at you and say, oh, well, you're yelling at me now because, you know, I just told you that you're crazy and that was just an innocent comment. But like you're reacting like any normal human being would to abuse, manipulation, gaslighting. And then they gaslight you even more by telling you that like you're actually crazy and something's wrong with you. So then that shifts the belief that turns into shame. And you start being ashamed of yourself and how crazy you are and how this and that you are. And you genuinely believe that you don't know the difference between reality and your imagination because this person that you trust and believe, you know, and that's why they do the love bombing so that you trust them. um, 
they're telling you this about yourself. And then you end up going to therapy, they tell you nothing's wrong with you. And then it's just even more confusing, because you're convinced that something's wrong with you. So gaslighting is really, it's terrible. Um, and it's, you know, it's just in a nutshell, when someone tries to make you believe something that's not real about yourself or about like a situation that you're trying to resolve. And, you know, they just kind of deflect from the real issue and create a brand new issue so that the initial issue, which was their abuse, is just kind of like swept under the rug at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's pretty interesting that, uh, they build so much trust in them, right? Mm -hmm. So that they then destroy the trust that you have in yourself. So uh, through this intermittent reinforcement, they build trust like, yeah, trust me, I'm the only answer or I'm the uh, solution to your problems. And then through gaslighting and things like that, they actually really decrease your own self-trust and your own confidence and your own sense of intuition or whatever, because they tell you that you're crazy. So it's kind of like both ways, like diminishing your self-trust and then uh, raising the trust to them that I think that the combined force of these two things creates this big thing right where we are just co completely manipulated um and this is crazy and yeah it's I, I i seriously need to repeat that because it's so crazy that you can't see it when you're in it that's just so crazy like you are not able to see this pattern unless someone really points it out to you and even if it's pointed out sometimes you might not see it because you might be in complete denial because you're so manipulated so it's just freaking crazy because the you know the person that i was with he literally manipulated every single friend of mine every single person and he turned them against me at some point and of course after that they realized and they came back to me but every single person like all my best friends were at some point like against me because they were manipulated so much and it's just like so crazy how this can happen right and people who have been friends with me for years and there this person entered entered our life and then it just shifted beliefs of everyone it's it's just i, I still cannot believe that because i'm a, i'm a very loyal friend and I have friends, you know, for 13 years or six years or like a lot of time, right? Uh, I'm a loyalist uh, Enneagram personality type. So for me, it's like easy to have long-term friendships. But this person just entered and completely just uh, reversed it. And I was like, what the heck just happened? You know, how did it happen? That even the people that were quite strong in their boundaries, strong in their sense of self, uh, people who had, you know, for example, observer personality, for the observer personality uh, Enneagram type, they don't really take also other people's opinions unless they really make sense. They usually have their own internal authority as well but even these people were manipulated and completely like trusted this person and not me and i'm just like how how did it happen and another thing that um that i think that narcissists use is the triangulation um this technique where also uh, teal swan uh, my mentor is explaining it where there is a and i feel like also the church is the one who uses it a lot i mean uh, in the you know the whole idea where there is a victim there is a villain and there is a savior right so if if uh, we are a victim and our narcissist is a savior and there is some kind of evil outside of us, right? And then they have to protect us. So we need to trust them to guide us. So we need to, you know, do everything that they say because they are protecting protecting us from all these, I don't know, bad people or bad behaviors or bad whatever else they uh, come up with. And this is such a powerful manipulation technique. It's so crazy how much it's worth. Or even like compar comparison, I feel. It's another technique that I found that like, oh, you are so shit and this person is so good good right and now you are feeling like shit in comparison to this person to i don't know to the ex of your partner or to another uh, sibling right that you have if it's your parent who is a narcissist so i feel like it's so important to talk about all these things because if we don't bring this to the light so many people suffer because of that um so what do you feel like is the solution in terms of like how to operate when you're in this kind of relationship? Like, should you just quit and just be like, okay, I'm out of here because these people are never going to change and fuck it. Or you should be like, okay, I can see that the level of narcissism is not that big, for example, and maybe this person is able to shift or whatever. Or like, how do you even keep the boundary in a relationship with someone like that? Like, what do you feel like is the solution or is it, is there even a perfect solution for everyone or is it just a very individual matter? So it's uh, the best solution is no contact and you never talk to this person again. Like that is the best possible solution for you. 
This person's not going to change. And honestly, life is short, right? Like we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So it's like, you have to really think about it. Is this someone I want to keep in my life? Is this an acceptable way that I want to be treated on a regular basis by this person? Or, you know, can I kind of let them go? And, you know, if they're going to change, let them do their healing journey on their own. They're going to need their time to do that and process it, right? Because if you're dealing with a narcissist, they might tell you they're going to change. They're going to go on their whole healing journey, blah, blah, blah. And they might go to like one therapy session and say like, oh, I'm fixed now. So like, come back to me and they might get really impatient with you, right? Um, So just expect the expected with these people, like expect every word out of their mouth to be some form of a manipulation tactic. And even if they say they're going to change, true change takes a long time. It's going to take years. So you have to let this person go on their healing journey and not take their word of for it that they're just doing it and like they're going to continue being enmeshed in your life every single day, right? Because like a true healing journey, like you have to sort of really go within and you're not going to have an interest in like, you know, everybody else and managing your relationships with everybody else if you're really, really focusing on yourself. So that's like your first red flag that this person's full of shit and they're not actually going on a healing journey. Um, And so they're going to try every manipulation tactic in the book. When you do go no contact, they might love bomb you, tell you that you can change whatever you want to hear. And you were right, this and that, whatever. Or they might devalue you and tell you about how horrible you are. Or they might just discard you and, you know, maybe like swoop back in kind of get your trust gained again, just so they can discard you first, because they're really petty like that, right? So it's like, if this is a dynamic that's not working for you in your life, there's 7 billion people on this planet. So if you need to find like a whole new group of friends, it's gonna suck. It's absolutely gonna suck. It's not gonna be a walk in the park, but you've opened up like a window that, you know, it's not going to happen overnight where you're you're going to be able to recreate your whole life, but at least you're not going to be limited by these assholes in your life who are just kind of keeping you stuck, right? So, I mean, if you're in a relationship with somebody, they're showing signs that they might be a narcissist. You've tried to resolve things with absolutely zero success and you're always, it's always your fault somehow. And if you, you know, you breathed wrong, you did this one random little thing the wrong way and that just completely fucked up the whole relationship. And if you don't share children with this person, there's no reason to stay in contact, (laughs) like cut and run as much as possible. If you have to, (laughs) easier said than done, (laughs) easier said than done, obviously. Yeah, (laughs) way easier said than done. So funny, but I agree. Yeah, right. And it's like, there's going to be some degree of emotional work that you might have to do before you're actually okay with that decision right? Because it's not an easy decision. It's not a decision you're going to make lightly. This You've invested so much emotion. You've invested so much of yourself into this relationship. So it's not easy to say like, fuck this. Like I'm done. I'm never talking to this person again. So, you know, doing some inner work, doing some journaling, talking to somebody, looking at content about narcissism and deciding for yourself, going on Reddit, you know, there's all these narcissistic abuse subreddits. Um, Quora is another one. There's so many like online communities where you can kind of make sense out of things and make sense out of narcissistic abuse. And really that can help you really realize like, I don't need this shit in my life. Maybe I don't know where the good people are right now, but like I would rather find them and spend some time on myself and, you know, guarantee myself that I'll have a better time of finding them versus like just staying with these people who, you know, are bad for my mental health, just for the sake of having people in my life, because I don't know where to find other people, right? Um, Because that's a little bit of a codependency thing, too, right? But I mean, it's not like the correct solution is to just like run off to another country and just pretend that you're a new person. But you know, little by little, um, if you share children with a narcissist, you know, you're gonna have to deal with custody issues. Then you're fucked. You're fucked. Yeah. (laughs) 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 It's true. <laughs> you know, like prevent that before it happens if possible. But if it's already happened, you have a long road ahead of you. And it's just the reality, unfortunately, right? And your job as the parent of these children is to protect them. So you have to do what you have to do to protect them from this abusive person because the narcissistic parent is going to have an influence on them. That's going to fuck the kids up. And I'm not saying this to scare anybody, but it's just the reality, like narcissistic abuse 
young children, they're very impressionable, their brains. So like you want to protect your kids. So you want to talk to a lawyer and figure out what your rights are, wherever it is that you live and, you know, figure out like a safe plan. If you have to share custody, your conversations with this person are only about like the pickup and the drop off of the children. The narcissist will probably start saying things like you're you're an unfit parent. I'm going to share this with my lawyer, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, they're not going to have evidence of you doing anything stupid because they're just making up these random accusations. And if anything, them creating these problems, if it's all through text, you've got the proof right there that they're not fit to be a parent at the end of the day. Right. So it's like they're they kind of dig their own grave, but they use these tactics to scare you. Um, and so you want to use the gray rock method if, and I'll talk about what that is, but I'll talk about the next scenario with family, if it's a family member, and let's say you can't necessarily go full no contact with them. Um, you know, maybe you still have to see them at certain family events, or, you know, maybe you even have mutual friends with the narcissist in your life, and you want to keep those people in your life. You have to make the decision of like, what's less painful for you, right? Like, do I keep this one horrible person in my life at like a very big distance and like only use the gray rock method with them or like, and like still maintain these other friendships, but I'm stressed out all the time. Or do I just cut all these people out of my life? And you don't have to make that decision today. You can make that decision over time as you start your healing journey, as you start putting things together and putting pieces together and whatever. Um, but if you absolutely have to be in contact with this person for whatever reason, maybe you still live with them. Maybe you're saving up money to move out, whatever document everything that you can possibly document if necessary if there's like any legal stuff like it could be even a business partnership as well right so you want to just document as much as you can get legal resources involved if you have to um, but if that's not the case gray rock method and if it is the case you're still going to use the gray rock method and that is when you don't give any emotion in your responses you use one word answers um, because what they're really after is supply from you so they want you to be in a reactive state so being hyper aware of this and being hyper aware of your own reactions and how you react to what this person says to you is going to basically dictate how things are going to go. So when you gray rock, you want to not react whatsoever. And that can be really difficult to do, especially if you've got all these repressed emotions. So that's why doing the work is so helpful. And journaling is a really great way to do it. Like just journal for 20 minutes a day, vomit on paper, destroy the paper after that's a very effective way to like untangle your thoughts. And you're going to start making more sense of things that way than by talking to the narcissist because they're not going to clear up shit for you, whether you like it or not. Um, and then that in itself, you know, just kind of putting things into perspective, being in observer mode rather than absorber mode, right? Because like we tend to absorb if you're an empath, right? You're absorbing other people's energy. So just being aware of that and observing when you're doing that and just kind of taking a step back and deciding like, okay, no, this person's emotions are theirs. And a narcissist's emotions are really a manipulation tactic to get what they want out of you. So the less you're reacting, the less you're giving, the less of your energy you're putting out there for them, the better. They're not going to be happy about it though. So don't expect a narcissist to react favorably <laughs> to any boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> it's true though, right? Because they feel so entitled. They feel entitled to your reaction. That's what it is at the end of the day. They're entitled to your energy. And you're starting to come to terms with, no, no, my energy is my energy. My emotions are my emotions. And no one else gets to have access to this shit. Um, and so when you start gray rocking, they're going to try a little bit harder potentially, right? So they might devalue even more. They might really threaten the smear campaign. And of course, you know, you're... A, a fellow survivor of a severe campaign as well. And it really sucks. But at the end of the day, your true friends did come back to you. They did realize it for themselves. And any friends that didn't, they were never your friends to begin with. And, you know, hopefully it didn't take them too long, maybe a matter of weeks, maybe a matter of months tops. But if it was like years and years, it's like, okay, wow. You know, like hopefully that friend went on a healing journey and then figured it out. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's hard. It's not easy. None of this shit is easy. But like, it's also not easy being in this enmeshed type of relationship. And if that's not what you want for the rest of your life, like you can definitely put your foot down and start making different choices. It's not going to be a walk in the park and you might need extra support on that journey. And that's okay. There's no shame in that as well. You know, you could work with a therapist, you could work with a life coach, you could, you know, just kind of follow pages on Instagram. Like I get DMs every day from people that just followed me for like a couple of months. And they're like, that empowered me 
to set my boundaries. The narcissist reacted exactly how, you know, you said that they would in your posts and I was prepared for it. So like, as long as you kind of know what to expect, which is exactly history is going to repeat itself, that will be really helpful for you. And just kind of taking your own emotions out of it and just understanding how their tactics affect your emotions, how you feel about your emotions, because at the end of the day, emotions are information. There's no such thing as a bad emotion. It might feel overwhelming to the nervous system. And that's a whole, that's probably like another podcast episode. Um, (laughs) But really like the way that we react to our emotions, we tend to see them as like a life and death situation. And it's like, you have to really put into perspective, your emotions will not hurt you. Feeling them will feel like shit as you're feeling it. But if you're accepting the emotion, allowing it in and not doing that in front of the narcissist, right? You do that on your own time alone, away from the narcissist in a different room if you live with them, right? Lock yourself in the washroom if you have to. Um, You know, doing that for yourself is the biggest gift you can give yourself because that's going to eventually turn you into the human bullshit detector and you're going to know when you're being manipulated. But, you know, that's... That's down the line. <laughs> That's way down the line. Human bullshit detector. I love this. Human bullshit detector. That's amazing. That's such a beautiful, beautiful, uh, yeah. Just Thank you. Definition. Yeah, it's amazing. I love that. And so do you feel like the narcissists are kind of like meant to just be single and just spend their whole life on their own because they are not capable of forming like good relationships with people? If there is kind of like no hope for them to change, then... Should they just be freaking on their own? They can have each other. <laughs> right? They can go destroy Perfect. each other. <laughs> right? Perfect. I, mean, I don't know if day. that would work. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? If enough targets of narcissistic abuse really use these tools, like gray rocking and just like protecting your energy, who knows? That could be what motivates narcissists to actually be like, oh, wait, something I'm doing is not working. <laughs> Who knows, right? But as long as they've got supply and people enabling them, like they're never going to change because at the end of the day, they they are doomed to a life of just like getting supply from people. And it's a really pathetic way to live, but that's up to them at the end of the day. And you cannot force somebody to see something that they don't see as a problem, as a problem. And they have to, like, change has to come from within, from that particular person who wants to go through the change. And narcissists, unfortunately, I mean, they're not going to change. And, I mean, you can, if you don't believe me, that's okay for anyone listening. You can do a Google search. And, like, there are actual, like peer-reviewed articles that like they don't change like therapy is very unsuccessful for them if anything when they go to therapy it makes them worse because then they kind of learn from their therapist even more what empathy looks like and then they use that to like you know target people even more in like a more underhanded secretive way so it really just sort of makes them even more dangerous at the end of the day so I mean, Mm. they're adults (laughs) they're free to behave how they want to behave but at the end of the day As targets, we get to decide who stays in our life or not. And, you know, you're allowed to have empathy for them. But at the end of the day, don't let that empathy make you believe that, like, you need to pacify their emotions and be there for them and, like, show them the way because that's just, you know, focus on you, put that energy into you and your healing journey. Mm, beautiful thank you so much for sharing everything that you've shared and i feel like it's so empowering for people who are victims of narcissistic abuse to know all that and to know how to cope with that so i'm super grateful that you shared uh, this all of this with us and yeah i i agree with uh, a lot of things that you're saying because based on my own experience i know that this is exactly how it works so i'm super super grateful for you and for your beautiful wisdom that you shared here and if someone struggles with narcissism still or uh, you know with narcissistic people around them uh, what is the best way to contact you or find you where do do people uh, find your content of course so you can find me on instagram or tiktok at let's get your shift together all one word um i do run group coaching programs every uh now and again so you know keep an eye out for that if that's something you're interested in and right now i've got a course on letting go of false hope if you are stuck in that false hope there's a mini course on it it's great it can really be that first baby step in realizing that like you deserve more out of life and yeah 
just uh, follow me on Instagram or TikTok and you'll get all the updates there. Amazing. Thank you so, so for this conversation. It's been really, really great. Awesome. I'm so grateful for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope this episode's helpful for your viewers or listeners. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, beautiful souls, for being with us. I hope that this knowledge has really helped you understand narcissism and how you can cope with it if you have some someone like that in your life, maybe a person, maybe a partner, maybe a parent. And this has certainly helped me to understand it even more uh, on an even deeper level. And if you'd like to find me, I'm The Connection Catalyst on Instagram. Thank you so much for tuning in and stay tuned next episode.